Okay, the king had his nobles, the knights, the dukes, the duchess, the earls, the barons, and so forth, and that was about 5% of his population. And then the people who actually did the work were the serfs, the 95%, okay? Now, how this shook down was that your people from this area down here came and became your serfs, and the people from this area came down and became the nobles. And so you had this, this noble, noble class here of people, Now I wouldn't say class, this noble category of people. It wasn't a class, it was sort of like they were just the guys. The king had a proper system of rents. He would rent the land to the nobles, who in turn would sub it to the serfs. So everybody had to do their fair share and all this kind of stuff, whatever. That meant as those well you could get by with because nobody could keep what he earned. Even the nobles were being changed. And a matter of fact, uh, Prince, uh, this guy John was really a nut, this King John. And uh, he, his, his favorite entertainment after a meal was to have the curtains part and, and have watch nobles being hanged. They did hang nobles after dinner as a, for sort of a treat. And guys would go, Bleh. And uh, so the nobles got together and they said, you know, this is not good for our health. And so what they did was that they, they, got, they got a big army together. The barons got a big army together. And they, uh, they uh, asked John to come down for a little seminar they were having south, <laughs> south of the Thames River there in Runnymede. And, uh, and so they surrounded John with their army. And they said, John, we would like you to sign in the year 1215. We would like you to sign a document uh, called the Magna Carta. And the king says, well, what does that mean? They said, well, it means magnificent contract. He says, yes, I know, but what does it do? And they said, oh, it gives us the ownership of England. <laughs> you see, after today, you won't own England anymore. We'll own England. I mean, was this a deal or what? <laughs> Never in the history of time had anybody ever come up with that idea. It came right out of these guys. They, it was a Viking stuff, see? <laughs> so John says, well, well, you know, he goes out for a little break. He looks at his army. He says, well, why would I say anything like that? And they said, well, if you'll sign it, then we won't cut your head off this afternoon as scheduled. <laughs> so we, we do a lot of seminars across the country. We do a lot of motivational training with our agents and so forth. And basically, we found that you can't beat that for a good close. <laughs> and so the king bought a Magna Carta. He signed on the line, which was dotted. And now the Magna Carta is in effect. The king was no longer the sovereign in England. Isn't that interesting? The king didn't own the place. The nobles owned the place. Did this have an effect on England? You bet. You bet. Because it wasn't very long later, until about 1295 here, some interesting things happened, because this was our Magna Carta. Okay? They said, well, look, this is really kind of crazy. We own the land, and the king is still taxing us. The king was putting the tax on the land. He's still collecting the tax. And so the guys got together. They said, well, this doesn't make any sense. So they went to the king in 1215, and they said, king, we want to start a parliament. And he said, well, what's that? And they said, well, that's where we make the law instead of you. <laughs> the king looks out the army, out the window, he sees their army, and he says something like, okie dokie. <laughs> Reminds me of a story about Jimmy Carter. Supposedly, David Rockefeller called up Jimmy Carter back in the late 60s and said, Jimmy, if we make you president of the United States, would you do everything I tell you? And Jimmy thought, and he said, peanut butter. Okay, so anyway, so what we have, you see, is basically the same thing, okay? So the king now no longer made the king. <laughs> it's really hard to do serious seminars. Okay, now, so what happens? So the king no longer made the law. The law was made by the nobles. And what do you suppose they decided? Well, they wouldn't pay tax. <laughs> what a shock. <laughs> just like that. I mean, just pass the law. The nobles from now on would not be taxed. <laughs> Are we having fun? So now what did they do? Well, they went all to the world. They went into Africa. They went to India. They went to China. They went to Austria, Australia. They went to the New, the new World, the new, uh, North America. And every place they went, the nobles could make everything they wanted to make, and they were never taxed. Now, occasionally, the indigenous citizens wanted to tax them, like Mahatma Gandhi or something like this. And they would, uh, they would decide, OK, since these guys from England are getting all the natural resources out of our country, we want to tax them. Now, the noble had a solution to that, okay? What he would do then is that he would bring in the British Army. <laughs> and the government now would no longer be an indigenous government. It would be called a colony. See, a colony is where the laws are made from London. Is, are we, is this interesting? Where the, now the nobles make the law, and they decided that they wouldn't even be taxed in any part of the world. <laughs> And if they had a problem with that, the British Army would go in. Now, what happened, you see, was that the British Army was protecting the business of the nobles. 
The British army went all over the world. It came to the point where the sun never set on the British Empire. The British Empire was simply the nobles making all the money they wanted to make and keeping it. We now understand British Empire. That's all it was. And to make sure that there weren't any problems, they had an army. <laughs> and it was a good army. This army, uh, before 1700, w w went 300 years undefeated. All the powers of the world put together could not defeat the British army. It was incredible. It was powerful. Nobody fussed with the British army. Well, that was uh, Parliament, 1295. Okay, then as we pointed out, some interesting things happen here. See, notice what we're learning. A little bit of internal control. A little more internal control. You see why history cannot be taught in the government school? Because it's going contrary to the government philosophy. And so it's just not taught. It's called, it's not there, existentialism. <laughs> okay, now, okay? Okay, so then along about 17, or 1379, we have Tyndale. Tyndale printed the Bible language. He was burned, okay, Tyndale. Okay, along about 1420, we have, uh, or I'm sorry, that was Wycliffe, excuse me, that was Wycliffe. I get these guys all mixed up here. That was John Wycliffe. He was burned at the stake. Okay, John Tyndale had the same thing happen to him. Okay, that was that was a like hundred years later. Okay, or many many years later. Okay, we have uh, Tyndale and then Wycliffe up here. All right, and and uh, Henry VIII cut his head off because Henry VIII was a Roman Catholic at the time. That was against their their law. Well, Henry VIII now had some interesting problems because he didn't have a son. After he'd been married to this uh, uh, Catherine of Aragon for eight years, he, he'd had a couple of girls, but no, no male children. And so he went to his archbishop, Sir Thomas More, and he said, Tom, he said, I'm paraphrasing this, I, I want a divorce. And Tom says, good grief, but Henry, you can't have a divorce. You've been married eight years. He said, that's okay, I want, a, I want an annulment. <laughs> and he said, you got to annul eight-year marriage. And so he checks with the pope and says, can't be done. So Henry has a very novel and imaginative, creative solution to this problem. He cuts off Tom's head, okay? And then he starts a church called the Catholic Church of England. And he is the Pope. Is this interesting? And of course, then he went ahead and introduced the concept of disposable wives, right? Now, and so what happens, you see, <laughs> is that now there was a new church. The Holy Roman Empire had just uh, collapsed. Now, the Holy Roman Empire was neither Holy Roman nor it was an empire. All it was was that the Pope blessed the kings. So it made the king have the benefit from the, from the, uh, from the, the so-called so God man or whatever have you, okay? Now, so you see, <laughs> see the system really is still, they're still trying to push it, okay? It's interesting, okay, that the, that the guy on top is God. <laughs> okay, interesting stuff. All right, now, uh, to, to shield it within the framework of our country now, you don't know who the guy is. Like, who is the guy that owns the Federal Reserve System? Well, let's see, we know the Federal Reserve System is not an American corporation. We know it's not a government agency. We know that the president can have, can appoint governors, but governors don't own the place. Who owns it? Well, obviously it must be God. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, you see? Hmm. Okay, the internal control is wrecking the external control. There's a conflict going on, don't kid yourself. And you can choose which side you want to be on. One is like a wave coming in. One's a wave going out. You know, this is like the rest of the reason Russia collapsed is because it was going the wrong way. If you go the wrong way, you collapse. If you buy into America too, you're going this way. You will collapse. You won't own anything on Friday. You'll work 40 years and be broke. You'll die spending your kids' inheritance. You don't, the kids don't have any inheritance. You've got to live off them. Because the thing is going this way. Now, it doesn't have to go this way. This is what our meeting is all about. Okay, interesting stuff. So we have 1420 comes along, Tyndale. All right. Henry VIII now, in, in 14, uh, 14, uh, I'm sorry, 1440, excuse me. In 1442, Henry VIII now uh, has written in the British Constitution that the King of England is the head of the church. That's still in the British Constitution, by the way. Did you know that a few years back, and it says in the British Constitution, by the way, that if a commoner marries a member of royalty, it requires the permission of the church. I mean, the, the church, the government over in England still runs the Anglican church. Now, did you know that a few years back when Prince Charles wanted to marry Princess Diana, or whatever her name was, that, that that required the permission of the church? You see? And his mom said, okay. All right? No. <laughs> again, again, not knowing history makes, a, makes the uh, National Enquirer undecipherable. 
Okay, now, you see, once we get history, we have an interesting shot at it, don't we? We have an interesting shot at it. Okay, now we have Henry VIII come along. Well, Henry VIII uh, began what was called the Anglican Church, and he took Tyndale's Bible. You know, it was really interesting that Tyndale's prayer just before his head was cut off was that, the, was that God may open the eyes of the Church of England, or the King of England. And in, uh, in about 1445, Henry VIII decided that Tyndale's Bible was pretty good after all. He had manuscripts printed or written and put in all the churches in England. Isn't that interesting? So he changed his mind. <laughs> so for Tyndale, it was a little bit late. Okay? But the interesting thing is, see, even though God dies physically, his works live on. This is kind of an interesting concept. Because even though these guys were martyred, they were very effective. They were, they were, they were really instituting internal control, even though their body was taken away. This is heavy stuff. Okay, now, this goes along now uh, until about uh, 15, or t till about uh, 1599. And again, I'm just jumping through this. You can get back into history and you can find all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm just, just skipping through, the, through the, the rocks here. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. Okay, 1599, we had Gutenberg. Okay, what happened to Gutenberg? Well, he invented the movable type press. Up until this time, there weren't any libraries because nobody had any books. The only books were in monasteries or somewhere they were laboriously hand copied. Now all of a sudden, Gutenberg uh, invents a printing press, movable type, okay, da -da -da -da. What happens in 1601? The king of, of uh, Scotland, James, comes down, the Stuart kings, because they, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, was back in, uh, Henry VIII's daughter, uh, running England and converting, putting all the Protestant or so-called Anglican people in, this is why John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, wrote it in prison, because all the preachers were put in prison and uh, the, the Roman government was brought back, the Roman church was brought back, and so, uh, Henry, or so James comes down from Scotland and he completely takes over England and he introduces the, uh, the actually what was called the, the Scottish Presbyterian Church at that time. He didn't even introduce the Church of England. Okay, and, but he had all the Bibles printed in English. Isn't this interesting? So this King James Bible now was produced about 1611. So here we have the King James version of the Bible. And it was written in English, and it was printed on a press, and everybody was given a copy. So the government sanctioned everybody in England now having a copy of this Bible. Well, you'd think that'd be the end of the problems for England. That was the start of their problems. <laughs> because guys would start reading this Bible now, and this was amazing because they never had a book before. So they wanted to learn to read, they read from the Bible. They wanted to teach somebody to read, they read from the Bible. They wanted to have a book at home, they had the Bible. It was the only book there was. <laughs> Well, it had a tremendous effect on England. It's the basis of the whole English language, okay? It also changed England radically because it said in the Bible that Jesus Christ was the head of the church. Uh-oh. <laughs> Does anyone see a conflict? <laughs> mm-hmm. And so they decided, well, we want to start teaching our children that Jesus Christ is sovereign. They said, no, no, the government will teach the, church, the kids because we want to teach them that the king is sovereign. <laughs> We've now understood public education, haven't we? Who's the sovereign? You're going to get different stories depending on the source of the education, aren't you? And for the government to be sovereign, it must run the schools. That's the 10th platform of the Communist Manifesto, by the way. This, that can't happen until governments run the schools. Oh, boy. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Now, so it doesn't take these guys very long. It takes like nine years. <laughs> and these guys just blow. I mean, they blow. They said, this isn't right. They said, let us get thee out of here. They get some boats, and they sail. <laughs> They sail over. <laughs> they sail over to America. Nobody even went there before. <laughs> I mean, that was it. You see, they wanted to worship the sovereign, the, the spiritual sovereign. Well, okay. So now we have the Mayflower. Isn't that interesting? Now we often hear that, the, that these were called the colonies. Notice that's just recent history. They did not call themselves colonies or colonists. Isn't that interesting? They said that they would start, in the charter of the Mayflower Compact, they said, well, we really owe a debt of gratitude to King James, and we really think that was great, and now we're going to start a body politic. What's a body politic? It's a separate nation, isn't it? They just started a separate nation. Because out of this Bible, the Puritans got the concept that the self was governed by itself, not by somebody else. And that the self gave way to the family, and the family was run from within, that the family was best run inside than outside, which gave way to the church, and the church was better run inside than from outside, and which gave way also to business. And or their business should be run by them and not by the state, and they had their civil government should be run by them and not by somebody else. Totally internal. It was like, thanks, King James, but we'd rather do it ourselves. 